What does the Twilight series, the Lego movie, Hannibal, and Fast and the Furious 6 all have in common? They're from all different kinds of genres, from action to fantasy romance to a children's animation film and a horror movie all have in common. All of these films belong in the group that passes the Bechdel test, or officially known as the Bechdel-Wallace test. It's a way to measure female representation in films that goes by three very simple rules, which are one, must include two women, two, have at least one conversation about three that does not include or mention men at all. But these rules are too simple. Let me explain. The Bechdel test was never supposed to become this public way to measure femininity in films, due to how simple and how extremely low the bar these rules are. In fact, this so-called test was really meant to highlight the much bigger issues of how male-dominated the film industry was. Andy Zeisler, co-founder of Bitch Media, wrote of the test, Bechdel and Wallace expressed it as simply a way to point out the rote, unthinkingly normative plot lines of mainstream film. It was never meant to be a measure of feminism, but rather a cultural barometer. But how do we get to this point in the modern age where we are still using this test, rather than retiring it and moving on to a more effective one? Who even created the Bechdel-Wallace test, and is it even possible to fix it and make it more in-depth? I'm going to answer all of these questions in a three-part video series that talks about the history of the Bechdel-Wallace test, modern use and other variations of it, and my answer to a brand new and more in-depth version of the old Bechdel-Wallace test. I'm Pearl, and I'm going to fix the Bechdel test. But first, let's talk about who Alison Bechdel is, and how she changed femininity in films and media forever. Alison Bechtel was born in Lock Haven, Pennsylvania on September 10th, 1960, and grew up in Beach Creek. At the age of three, she started drawing, and it was here that she realized that she drew figure after figure with a disregard of background, but realized that all she drew were male figures. Growing up in the 60s, she became aware and said, boys, even when they were bad, were good, and when girls were bad, they were really bad. I grew up in the 60s, in the early 60s. I started noticing this incredibly sexist world where women were Beaver Cleaver's mother. Um, she was an idiot, or on Thorazine, or both. It just was not something I related to at all. And again, in the children's book illustrations and comics I was seeing as a kid, the, you know, the female characters were always somehow not generic. They weren't regular, they were always female people, as opposed to people. To cope with this, she basically rejected her female identity by keeping her hair short and playing among boys. And she also kept a small pocket knife. She then attended high school where her parents, Bruce and Helen, taught English literature at. It wasn't until after graduating from college that she started drawing comics more seriously. It was also during college that she finally became her gender neutral self. After college, she eventually got a job as a word processor for several years, then worked as a production manager for the Weekly Equal Times, after being rejected by several art graduate programs. It was sometime between these jobs that she discovered Howard Cruz's gay comics, which gave her a push to create her own comic. At the behest of a friend, Alison Bechtel submitted a drawing to Woman News, a monthly feminist newspaper, where her friend interned at. It was here where she changed the world of media forever. The comic strip she submitted garnered acclaim at Woman News, when it was published in 1983, from a drawing in the margin of a letter to a friend, to filling sketchbooks with drawings and captions, Dice to Watch Out For was created. It was here where the Bechtel test was born. This comic strip that Alison Bechtel submitted to a feminist newspaper from the push of a friend changed the landscape of media forever. Dykes to Watch Out For presents The Rule with thanks to Liz Wallace. Want to see a movie and get popcorn? Well, I don't know. 
I have this rule, see? I only go to a movie if it satisfies three basic requirements. One, it has to have at least two women in it. Who, two, talk to each other about three, something besides a man. Pretty strict, but a good idea. No kidding. Last movie I was able to see was Alien. The two women in it talk to each other about the monster. Want to go to my house and make popcorn? Now you're talking. Alison Bechtel shared this idea for a test with Liz Wallace, which then became the Bechtel Wallace test, something that Alison Bechtel herself prefers the name to go by. The character in the comic only watches movies that pass the Bechtel Wallace test, and the last movies she was able to watch was Ridley Scott's Alien from 1979. The inspiration came from a 1929 essay from Virginia Woolf's A Room of One's Own, which basically follows the same idea of the Bechtel Wallace test in which women portrayed in fiction are always limited compared to men. The Bechtel Wallace test gained popularity throughout the 2000s when discourse about women in film started gaining more and more traction, and it was in 2013 when Swedish cinemas started rating films based on their ability to pass the test, and that was history from then on. People started using the test to rate films. Until we got to the present. By the way, if you haven't seen part one yet, I highly recommend you do, because this is going to be a three-part series. Now, I hope you enjoy part two. It's the modern age now. Years and years of movies are now thrown against the backdrop of the Bechdel-Wallace test. More and more people now know about the test, and it's become a part of pop culture, with stickers and shirts. The Bechdel-Wallace test is now ingrained into our media conscience. Morty, do you know what the Bechdel test is? I just realized, now that there's two of us, we can finally do a video that passes the Bechdel test. Now Almost none of these movies pass the Bechdel test. Which now has the inclusion of books, video games, and even music, are now asked the question of whether or not they pass the Bechdel test. There has now been numerous media studies done that show that the better chance a film is going to pass the Bechdel test, the more likely it's going to make more at the box office. A study done by Portland State University student Catherine Gray Bouchot did a study that put two Netflix original movies against each other, one that passed the Bechdel test and the other didn't, and did a scene analysis of both movies that focused on the issues of perceived progressiveness, acceptability, portrayal of sex in media, sex roles, and which sex wrote the movie differ in either of the scenes. The films that Bouchot studied was The Kissing Booth from 2018 that didn't pass the Bechdel-Wallace test, and Sierra Burgess is a Loser, also from 2018, that did pass the test. Bouchot asked 50 participants, but only 34 answered in full, to interpret the two scenes on the scale of sexism and of progressiveness. Both of these were measured with a bipolar type scale used from Zimmerman and Dahlberg from 2008. The scale looked at the kinds of attitudes viewers had toward the portrayal of women in advertisements. It was rated on a 7 point scale. The higher the number was, the less progressive the attitude showed. The results of the study conducted showed that there was no statistically significant difference in any of the scenes. Showed that when it came to progressiveness, sexism, or acceptability. Another interesting thing that came up was when asked which scene that did pass the Bechdel test on the scale of how likely it was written by a male or female, of the 34 participants that answered in full, 64.7% believe that the movie that passed the Bechdel test, Sierra, was written by a female, while only 35.3% believe the film was written by male. While the other set of participants that watched the scene that didn't pass the Bechdel test, 33.3% believe the movie was written by a female, while 61.1% believe the movie was written by a male, and 1% or 2.9% believe the movie was written by other, meaning that there was no significant difference between what sex participants believed wrote which movie either. Meaning that whether or not a film can pass the Bechdel test, there is no difference in portrayal of sexism, acceptability, 
equality or progressiveness, which brings in other tests, which were created to tackle different issues, just like the Bechdel test was. Now, keep in mind each of the themes of all of the different tests, because it's going to be the basis for my brand new test. The first test we're going to go over is the DuVernay test. It was created by film critic Manola Dargis in 2016, and was named after producer, writer, and director Ava DuVernay. This test encourages both filmmakers and screenwriters to include complex POC characters with their own plot lines, fully developed personhood, and narrative significance. One of uh, a writer that I really love, Manola Dargis, uh, at the New York Times decided that she was going to name this test after me. An honor, but you, you really hope that, that people will take these kinds of things under consideration. When you're in the writer's room and you're writing a script, when you're directing, look around and say, wow, it'd be nice to have some people of color in this scene. Exactly. You know what I mean? Or, or behind the camera. What? You know what? The rules to pass are one complex characters. Stories that pass the test must feature at least two characters of color and they must not be in a romantic relationship together. These characters must have complex lives rather than existing only in relation to white characters. Two, names. The people of color in the story must have names. And three, speaking parts. Characters of color must have dialogue and their conversations must not meet be about supporting a white character. Films that pass this test include The Color Purple from 1985 and Dear White People from 2017. The second test is the Vito Russo test, which was created by GLAD, or Gay and Lesbian Alliance Against Defamation, is an LGBTQ media advocacy group, and the test was named after film historian and GLAD co-founder Vito Russo. This test highlights the importance of including a fully realized, consequential LGBTQ plus characters. The rules to follow this test are as follows. One, at least one character must be identifiably bisexual, lesbian, gay, and or transgender. Two, this character cannot be solely defined by their sexuality or gender identity. And three, this character must be integral to the plot to the extent that if they were removed, it would have a significant effect on the story. The movies that pass this test include But I'm a Cheerleader from 1999 and Brokeback Mountain from 2005. The third test is the Sexy Lamb Test, which was created by comic book and TV writer Kelly Sue DeConnick. Now, some context. In the Christmas story, there is a very historic scene that involves main character Ralph's father unveils to the family this lamp that has a sexy woman's leg as the base. Now using that context, according to DeConnick, if you can remove a female character and replace her with a sexy lamp and your plot still functions, <laughs> then fuck you. Movies that fail this test includes Batman from 1989 and Skyfall from 2012. This test is very subjective, exactly like the Bechdel test, and it shows the importance of including agency-driven female characters who are more than mere props. The final test, and fourth one, which is the spiritual successor to the Bechdel-Wallace test, is the Mako Mori test. This test was named after Mako Mori, a character from the 2013 film Pacific Rim. The test was actually created in response to it not passing the Bechdel test by Tumblr user Kalia in November 2014. While the Bechdel-Wallace test points out the quantitative nature of lack of women in films, Malko Mori tries to fix it qualitatively. In fact, there has been discourse that films should aim to pass Mako Mori, not Bechtel Wallace. The rules to pass Mako Mori are 1. It must include one or more female characters. 2. These characters must have their own story arcs. 3. The story arc shouldn't exist to support a male character's arc. While the ones I chose to go over today are only scratching the surface, there are many many tests out there that are aiming to solve the same issues exactly like the Bechdel-Wallace test, like the Willis test that tackles the issues of gender in songs, and Deegan's rules that tackles the overall issue of race and pop culture as a whole.
I'm going to focus solely on films and TV. Now, did you pick up a pattern as I was going through each of the different tests? Like how each test tackles different issues, like race and sexuality, and others were aiming to fixing the Bechdel Wallace test? Mako Mori, Vito Russo, Duvernay, all of these tests were created to fix the criticisms of the Bechdel Wallace test. And while these tests themselves have issues, it is a better representation of race and sexuality than the Bechdel Wallace test. So why is the public media still writing stories linking all of these tests back to the original when it's trying to fix the Bechdel Wallace test? It's because the Bechdel Wallace test started the conversation about how women were being portrayed in the media, which is why it keeps being brought up and compared to by these other tests. But what if there was a test that aimed to solve all of these issues? Well, the best it could. One test to finally retire the Bechdel test, and it being the industry standard where critics and discourse only pointed to this test as the standard of how we portray race, sexuality, and gender for our future and current media to represent. I think my test can solve the main criticisms of the Bechdel Wallace test and answer the questions of how we should portray the media that surrounds race, sexuality, and gender into one test, rather than multiple different tests. Here we are. Here is the final part to this three-part series of me finally fixing the Bechdel test. If you haven't seen parts one and two, I highly recommend it. But without further ado, here it is my answer to fixing the Bechdel test. But first, let's quickly go over how we even got here. Alison Bechdel is an American comic artist who created the Bechdel Wallace test after her friend convinced her to submit one of her comic strips that she drew on the margin on the letter to that she sent to a friend to a monthly feminist newspaper where she created the rural comic strip in 1985. The Bechdel Wallace test then became mainstream when a Swedish cinema started rating films using the test and started the conversation of how women should be portrayed in media, which created more tests that focused on different issues like the Vito Russo test that focused on issues of sexuality and the Duvernay test, which focuses on the issues of race. And here we are, my test that will finally retire the Bechdel Wallace test. But here's something that needs to be stated about the Bechdel Wallace test. The Bechdel Wallace test was never meant to be a test. In fact, it was never meant to become as public as it did. The Mako Mori test is the spiritual successor of the Bechdel Wallace test because it deals with the issue of how women are portrayed qualitatively, not quantitatively like the Bechdel Wallace test does. And one of the biggest criticisms is how does the Bechdel Wallace test measure how feminist a film is quantitatively? A lot of films that are very stereotypical towards women pass the Bechdel Wallace test, just like the study results showed that Bouchot conducted. And even Alison Bechdel's favorite movie, Groundhog Day, doesn't pass the test either. I don't really follow this scheme in my real life. What's no, your favorite um, movie? <laughs> Groundhog Day. Groundhog Day does not pass the Bechdel test. Majorly, majorly fails. <laughs> majorly fails yeah. the Groundhog Day. <laughs> Another big criticism that actually involves the movie Alien is how do we know if these fictional monsters are gender? And if they are, how can we tell if it's male or female? And what exactly is the defini official definition of a male character? Does that also include trans men or a female character that has male qualities? Alison Bechtel never meant this test that she created to be actually used as a test because she was actually using it as a way to show in a quantitative way how many films, including the industry itself, are excluding women by creating them as shallow characters rather than fully flushed out characters. Something that needs to be brought up, in fact it's important to my version of the Bechdel Wallace test is men. Why are we excluding men from the discussion of the topic of feminism? 
According to the Eastern Kentucky University's Women and Gender Studies, the definition of feminism is, feminism is an interdisciplinary approach to issues of equality and equity based on gender, gender expression, gender identity, sex, and sexuality, as understood through social theories and political activism. Historically, feminism has evolved from the critical examination of inequality between the sexes to a more nuanced focus on the social and performative constructions of gender and sexuality. Misusing the Bechdel test really hurts the purpose of feminism. In fact, there already is a test called the reverse test, where it follows the same exact format of the Bechdel test, but replaces women with men in the rules. The reverse Bechdel test. The criteria are as follows. One, the movie has to have at least one named male character in it. Two, that character has to be competent, moral, and masculine. And three, no male character in the movie can be gratuitously belittled or dominated by a woman. Why are we telling people that our conversation between a man and a woman is something less powerful or negative like makeup and cooking? Using the definition that EKU provided, the Bechdel test is basically hurting the equality of all sexes because the whole point of feminism is that everyone, regardless of sex, gender, or race, should be fighting for the equality of every single person. We need to retire the Bechdel test or it's going to keep hurting the whole purpose of what feminism is and represents according to the definition that EKU provided. What every Everyone needs to take away from this analysis is that there is a systemic issue in the film industry that is portraying women in a way that shows harmful stereotypes that's embedded in our society today. Not if a piece of media passes a test that was never meant to be taken seriously or regarded as an actual test in the first place. Even Alison Bechtel said that it was never meant to be taken seriously. Another important distinction to make is that the Bechtel test is not a way to evaluate whether a film is feminist. It was never meant to be a measure of feminism, but rather a cultural barometer. So, you're asking yourself, what is my answer in regard to fixing the Bechdel test? Well, these are the requirements. If you disagree with my answer, that is completely okay. Because this is my personal research from reading research papers and watching many, many videos about the Bechdel-Wallace test. My definition of feminism is different from everyone else's, and disagreement is fine, and it's completely normal. My rules to a brand new official Bechdel-Wallace test must follow these requirements. 1. Must include a POC. 2. Must include someone who is a part of the LGBTQ plus slash trans community. 3. Cannot include gender stereotypes. 4. Each character must have a well-developed storyline. 5. Can include a character with any kind of disability, but cannot be portrayed in a harmful way. And 6. Can include a conversation with a man, but it must be about another woman that is productive that does not include sexual or romantic intentions. I.e., if a conversation is taken out of the film and the rest of the film cannot proceed without it, it passes. You're probably asking yourself, are you serious? Does any media out there even fall under my set of new rules? If you've been paying attention to the B-roll I've chosen, it fits into my new rules. April 8th, 2022. Everything, everywhere, all at once. A science fiction film that shatters every multiverse possible and shatters my new test that everyone is a trope test. What I'm asking for is the bare basic for how women should be portrayed in media and honestly how everyone should be portrayed in media. Hence the name, everyone is a trope. Which is exactly what Everything Everywhere All At Once delivers to us, the viewers. A strong, fully flushed out character that has layers, that shows us how she functions. Which brings up my new rule. 
Wayman is talking to the IRS woman about Evelyn. These conversations can't be taken out because it wouldn't make sense. He was basically taking the fall for Evelyn from the IRS woman, for her being a chef and a novelist, for it showing up on tax reports. Even though later on, we find out that these were her alternate selves, which was why it was on the tax reforms. And that's it. That is my solution to the Bechdel test, which is the everyone is a trope test. That includes all of the criticisms and alternatives to the Bechdel test put into one. Now, I don't think my test is going to get massive attention, but what everyone needs to understand is that the Bechdel test is heavily flawed and needs to be retired because what we need is a better reform of the media, of how it portrays POCs, LGBTQ plus slash trans, and especially women. But I hope my test can hopefully start something like the Bechdel test once did. <laughs>